I'm uh, Fernando Costa. I'm uh, Assistant City Manager, and it's my uh, privilege to share with you some background information about the charter review process uh, so as to prepare you to participate in this process and provide us with the benefit of, of your comments. And I'll try to move briskly through some slides. Uh, first, to introduce the, uh, the Charter Review Task Force as appointed by the City Council. Uh, I mentioned uh, earlier, Ms. Bagsby, Dion Bagsby, is chair of the task force. She's a former Tarrant County Commissioner. Uh, we've heard already this evening from Bert Williams, the vice chair. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Pete Guerin, whom uh, Mr. Espino introduced. Uh, Henry Robola serves on the task force. Carlos Flores uh, represents uh, District 2 uh, on the task force. Uh, Julie Myers is not here tonight. Keith Shanklin is not here. Uh, Lou Moskowitz is here, though, uh, uh, representing uh, District 6. Uh, Mike Holt from District 7. Uh, Danny Scarth uh, representing uh, District 8, uh, uh, although he's actually a, a, a resident of District 4. And Mike Coffey uh, is here from District 9. Uh, so we've got uh, splendid representation from the task force here this evening. They're here uh, principally to listen to you so that they can hear firsthand what the citizens think. They'll be uh, reconvening as a full task force next week to begin formulating their conclusions and recommendations to the City Council. So it's very important uh, uh, that they listen directly to you so they can not just get a summary from City staff but to get uh, a sense as to what you think uh, by hearing your thoughts directly. A, a brief history of the City Charter. Uh, the State Legislature uh, granted our original City Charter back in 1873. Uh, and uh, in 1912, the State Legislature uh, uh, a approved uh, uh, a home rule amendment uh, uh, ratified by the voters of the state uh, whereby any city with a population of 5,000 or more could adopt its own charter uh, and consequently in 1924 that's exactly what Fort Worth did our first home rule charter which created what we now know as the council manager form of government so the day-to-day -day operations of the city are not run by the mayor they're run by the city manager uh, under the general uh, oversight of the nine-member city council. And we've had 13 amendments to the city charter uh, uh, since uh, 1924. 13 times the charter has been amended uh, through 2006. Ten years ago was the last time the charter was the subject of this kind of review, uh, starting in, in, in 20, uh, 2005, and uh, the issues were uh, put on the ballot in 2006 and approved at that time, uh, including uh, uh, council members' pay. Uh, that was one of the significant amendments that was approved in uh, 2006, uh, and other amendments, and we'll talk about uh, the amendments that are currently under consideration uh, for 2016. Uh, under state law, we may consider amendments to the city charter no more often than every two years, so we can't do it annually. We have to wait at least uh, two years before we undertake the process again. As a practical matter, in Fort Worth, it's been done uh, more or less every 10 years or so. Uh, the council approves the submittal of charter amendments to the voters, but only the voters can amend the city charter, just as only the voters can amend the state constitution, which we just did uh, last week. And as I mentioned, um, uh, 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 we have a charter review task force. That's been the common practice in Fort Worth Rather than the council deciding on its own what charter amendments they want to put before the voters, they usually rely upon an independent task force to provide them with advice, and that's exactly what we're doing once again this year. We won't go through all of these items. But, uh, the, the list on the screen uh, gives you a sense as to the range of uh, topics that are addressed uh, by the, the, the city charter uh, under the home rule provisions. We can cover the form of government, details about the governing body, the city council, selection of administrative personnel under the city manager, and a whole host of other uh, topics can be covered uh, by the city charter. Uh, the the uh, charter review that we're undertaking now consists of these five items, uh, which Councilmember Spino has already uh, mentioned to us. The number of council members, we currently have eight council members plus the mayor, a total of nine. Uh, we have two-year terms uh, for the council members and the mayor. Those terms are concurrent. They, they're all elected uh, at the same time every other year on odd-numbered years. 
and they're compensated at the rate of $25,000 for individual council members and $29,000 for the mayor. We also want to consider a couple of dozen technical amendments and our city attorney, Sarah Fullenweider, will uh, describe them to us uh, in just a few moments. We're following the schedule that appears uh, uh, on the wall. Uh, we're in the midst, of, this is the fourth of six public hearings that we're conducting around Fort Worth uh, for the different council districts. Uh, we'll have two more, one on Thursday evening, one next Monday, and then the task force will meet on November 18th to formulate recommendations. Those recommendations will go to the city council on December 8th uh, for the council to, to receive the recommendations. They then will hold two public hearings of their own. So if you want to speak directly to the city council, you'll have those two opportunities in January on the 12th and the 26th in, in conjunction with regular city council meetings. And then on February 2nd, we anticipate that the council will be adopting an ordinance uh, calling the charter election uh, to be held in May. And we'll hear more about that uh, shortly from uh, our city secretary, uh, Mary Kaiser. Uh, the charter election will be held on Saturday, May 7th. Uh, in reviewing uh, provisions of the city charter, the task force decided to consider some comparison cities, cities of similar size with council manager forms of government in Texas and in other states. So we're looking at Austin, Dallas, El Paso, San Antonio from Texas, as well as Charlotte, Kansas City, and Oklahoma City uh, from other states. And so we'll, we'll make reference to these cities as we describe the existing provisions of the city charter. And I'd like to cover those four major policy issues and for each one, give you a little bit of background information and give you some questions that you might want to consider uh, as you think about what you might want to say uh, or, or do in respect uh, to these issues. So first, in respect to the number of council members, as I mentioned, we have eight council members plus the mayor. Each of the eight council members now represents a little over 800,000 citizens. Uh, we have a population now of 812,000. So divided by eight, you can get a little more than, than 100,000. Uh, in most of the other comparison cities, Austin, Dallas, El Paso, and Oklahoma City, each council member represents fewer than 100,000 uh, residents. Uh, the exception uh, among the comparison cities was San Antonio, where each of the 10 council members represents more than 140,000. They have a 1.4 million population, so each of the 10 council members represents about 140,000. The next big issue, uh, well, before we get into the next big issue, uh, the questions. Uh, as you think about the number of council members, I know this is an important issue for uh, many of the folks uh, here tonight. Uh, think about would increasing the number of single member districts, perhaps from eight to 10, or possibly even uh, 12, or whatever number you think is appropriate, would that provide all Fort Worth residents with better representation? Would increasing the number of districts provide minority groups, such as Hispanics and African Americans, with better representation? Would increase the number of districts provide better representation for, for residents from different geographic areas? As Mr. Espino mentioned earlier, so we, the city encompasses some older urban neighborhoods within Loop 820, as well as some newer suburban neighborhoods beyond the loop. And as you can see from the map that appears on the left-hand side of the, of the, of the, of the screen, uh, most of the council districts uh, include both uh, central city neighborhoods and neighborhoods uh, beyond Loop 820. Uh, the only exceptions are, are District 6, which is entirely uh, outside the loop, uh, and District 9, which is entirely inside uh, Loop 820. Uh, the second big issue uh, uh, concerns the, 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 the terms of office. Uh, uh, we currently have two-year terms, and, and council members are elected in odd numbered years. In Dallas and San Antonio, they also have two-year terms. But in uh, other cities, they have longer terms. Uh, Charlotte has three-year terms, and Austin, El Paso, Kansas City, and Oklahoma City all have four-year terms. So a lot of folks think that instead of running for office every other year, we had to have longer terms, three years or four years. And so the, the rhetorical questions you might ask yourself are, could longer terms increase the effectiveness of the mayor and council members by giving them more time in office? Would longer terms in any way reduce their accountability that's the other side of the coin. Uh, do we want them to be accountable every other year at the ballot box? And should the cost savings of holding less frequent elections, up to a half million dollars or so per municipal election, be a significant factor 
in this decision as to how often to hold these municipal elections. The third uh, policy issue is staggered terms. We currently have uh, uh, two-year concurrent terms. Uh, Dallas, San Antonio, Charlotte, and Kansas City also have concurrent terms. They elect all their elected officials at the city level at one time. Uh, but in Austin, El Paso, and Oklahoma City, they stagger their terms uh, so that not all the council members are subject to election uh, at the same time. So we might ask ourselves, would staggering terms provide the council with greater continuity and stability, not running the risk of all the council members uh, uh, being uh, uh, terminated uh, in any one election. Uh, that has not happened in the last 50 years. The majority of the council has never been uh, voted out of office in any single election. It is a hypothetical possibility, naturally, but it has not happened in Fort Worth in the last 50 years. Is it important to limit the amount of turnover that could occur in any council election? Again, a hypothetical possibility. Is it important to elect the mayor and all council members at the same time? Is there a good reason for all of them to come up at the same time? Do the terms of office, two years versus three or four years, affect the importance of staggering those terms? So that, in other words, if we have two-year terms, maybe you want them to be concurrent. If we go to three or possibly four years, does it become more important to stagger those terms? And finally, should the cost of holding elections be a significant factor in this decision? And finally, the, uh, the fourth uh, in, in, uh, of the policy issues uh, before the Charter Review Commission uh, is compensation. The mayor is currently, made 20, is currently paid $29,000 per year. The individual council member is $25,000. Uh, in comparable cities, uh, salaries range from $24,000 for the mayor and $12,000 for council members in Oklahoma City. That is at the low end of the range, up to $123,000 for the mayor and $61,000 for council members in Kansas City. Many folks will argue that Fort Worth has grown a lot uh, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, and now with the city as large and as complex and as diverse and as rapidly changing as Fort Worth, some would argue that uh, the council members' jobs are now full-time uh, and they deserve to be compensated accordingly. Others think it ought to continue being uh, a part-time job uh, and the compensation should, uh, should be uh, proportional to part-time service. You might ask yourselves, is it important to consider the time demands of the position when setting compensation? Is it important to consider the city's budget? Is this a significant issue? Would increasing the compensation allow more citizens an opportunity to serve in public office? So not just those folks who are uh, independently uh, wealthy uh, can afford to serve uh, on the city council. So these are among the questions you might ask yourselves uh, in pondering uh, the issue of compensation. We're in the midst of this public engagement process. I, I mentioned uh, the six public hearings are part of the community outreach effort. We have a speakers bureau and the meeting in the box. If any of you uh, are associated with a neighborhood association uh, or with a civic group of one kind or another and would like for us to provide you with a presentation, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, we've received requests, uh, for example, from the uh, uh, Hispanic, uh, I believe it's, uh, Hispanic Leadership Council. Uh, we received a request from the Central City uh, Redevelopment Committee. Uh, we will be speaking to the Fort Worth League of Neighborhood Associations uh, and uh, are happy to meet with other groups uh, upon request. Uh, we're using traditional media, the city's electronic newsletter, uh, the monthly uh, water bill insert, uh, which uh, is uh, commonly uh, read by, by, by most of our residents. Uh, the weekly bulletin from our community engagement office, uh, Michelle Good is here. She's uh, our director of communications and, and, uh, and public engagement. Uh, using our, our website and social media, uh, you're, a lot of folks uh, feel more comfortable communicating to those uh, media than, than through uh, public meetings. And, and so that's another opportunity. Uh, videos uh, and media relations. Uh, we're trying to cover the waterfront in all the ways in which citizens can participate in city government and communicate uh, with their elected and appointed representatives. Uh, this is another uh, view of the uh, public hearing schedule. As I mentioned, we have two more coming up after tonight uh, at Hazel Harvey Peace Center for Neighborhoods and at Sweet Home Missionary Baptist Church. And so I'd like now to call on uh, Sarah Fultonwater, city attorney, uh, to talk with us about the proposed technical amendments 
uh, which complement uh, the policy uh, issues that we've just discussed. So hopefully you picked up a sheet that looks like this that's entitled Major Issues Identified by the City Council. And what I'm going to do is run through what these propositions and the technical amendments would look like on the ballot. Okay, so I'll go over first the policy issues that Fernando has discussed with you. So proposition number one, should um, the terms of the city council be increased? And of course these are blank because the task force has not decided what they're going to recommend and, and ultimately the city council will make that decision. Proposition number two is to addresses staggered terms. So should the city charter be amended to provide for staggered terms? Number three talks about increasing the number of council members from nine to perhaps 11 or more, whatever the um, task force recommends and the council decides. But you will see that the f it would not happen until the first election following the 2020 census. Now this is because right now, if we did it now, we'd be using old data from 2010, which doesn't accurately reflect ethnicity and other factors that are needed to actually do a really accurate redistricting. And so that would wait till we got that uh, um, 2020 census in and we would use that information. Proposition four is what Fernando really to is compensation of the mayor and city councils should it be increased. And this would start October 1st, 2016, if it was approved by the voters. So now the technical amendments what the staff has done is gone through, since we're not doing a full city charter um, revision, we've gone through and tried to pick things that we think are not consistent with state law, they're not consistent with our current practice, or they just need to be cleaned up. So the vacancies in the city council, right now the city council can only appoint someone to a vacant position if it's vacant for 30 days or less. All right, so it, just say if you have a death on the city council, either you have to wait till the next election, you have to ask the governor to um, have a special election, or you just leave the seat vacant unless it's 30 days or less. What this would do, and this would be especially important if the terms are increased, to allow the council to appoint someone to sit for 12 months or until the next person is elected. Um, swearing in of city councils, right now what you have to do, what the council has to do is canvas the election results. In other words, we get those results from Tarrant County. The council has to, to canvas those, in other words, say yes, we agree, these are the results and these are the winners, but we cannot <coughs> swear the council members in at that meeting until the next city council meeting. And I don't know why the charter is written like this. It doesn't really serve any purpose. And we would like to have the flexibility or suggest that the council have the flexibility of swearing you in on the same day that you're elected. Uh, proposition number seven, right now in the city charter, if employees decide they want to run for public office, their employment is terminated with the city. That's inconsistent now with state law. So we need to revise that to uh, make it consistent. All right, proposition number eight deals with when we do um, redistricting, we're required to do a meets and bounds description of every district. And you can imagine if you have to go out and get a surveyor to do that description, it's very expensive for the taxpayers. And so we would like to delete this requirement, and allow us just to draw them on the map so that you can see where it is without having to actually go out and do a, a survey of the meets and bounds of each district. Proposition number nine deals with residence requirements. Right now it says that if you're going to run for a city council seat, you must reside in the district six months before the election day. Well, the problem with that is you don't know when that starts. You don't know how many, do you count each month has a different number of days? How do you count? Is it a full six months? Is that 31 days or, or 30 days? So we're suggesting change that to 180 days from the first filing date. That way it's very clear that if you have an issue of how long somebody's lived there, you can actually count it. All right, proposition number 10 deals with the right of a public hearing by department directors. Now, if you remember, Fernando talked about that this is a city manager form of government. It's run by the city manager, set policy by the city council. So except for appointed officials like myself and Mary and the city manager and the city auditor, everyone else is hired and fired by the city manager. So it's up to him to make those decisions. But in the city charter right now, any department director has the right to go in front of the city council and ask for a hearing about his proposed termination by the city manager. Well, this just kind of conflicts with the whole way that the government's supposed to work, and it doesn't tell the, what the city council's supposed to do after the public hearing, because they can't tell the city manager what to do because that's not consistent with the rest of the charter. And so this is just kind of an odd provision in there. And so we were, are suggesting we delete this. 
The second one actually goes to the same type of public hearing, but for appointed officials. And the current practice now, although the city council does have the right to remove appointed officials, the current practice now is that discussion happens in executive session. Usually that's where you're evaluated and the decisions are made and then you're, you're told afterwards whether or not you're going to be terminated or not. And so actually having a public hearing really doesn't serve any purpose there. So we're suggesting that we delete this. Proposition 12 goes to municipal judges. Right now our municipal judges are appointed for two years. And if for some reason they can't serve, then we will continue to pay them. In other words, they won't be given any dockets, but they, we continue to pay them until, the next, until their term is up. So in other words, if they do something maybe unethical or they're not fit to serve for any reason, the council has no way to remove them. And so we're suggesting that this proposition would allow the council, the majority of the council, to remove a municipal judge for cause, only for cause. So you don't want the council to have you want to keep that independence between the judge and the council, but for cause, they would be able to remove them. All right, proposition number 13. Right now, it says that the Department of Finance will assess and collect taxes. And you know, that's the job of Tarrant County now, and so we would like to amend this language to reflect the current practice that Tarrant County does this job. All right, adoption of the budget in accordance with state law. Right now, once the city manager introduces the budget, it has to be on the city council agenda for public hearing and published in the newspaper for every week until it's adopted by the city council. And this usually can run anywhere from four to five weeks. And so it's a cost to the taxpayers. And what we would like to do is be able to have those public hearings in accordance with state law, which would be at the minimum one public hearing um, if there's no increase in tax, and then two public hearings if there's an increase in tax and you wouldn't have to publish it, uh, you know, again for four or five weeks, which is again an expense. Um, the independent auditor proposition number 15, it will be amended to clarify the duties of an outside auditor as it relates to the city budget, what the city council is expecting them to provide for them. So this is kind of just a clarification. And proposition number 16, right now Tarrant County has the public health department. The city of Fort Worth does not have one as it did in the past. And so we're suggesting that we amend this to delete, to delete that requirement. Now, when you do a recall of a council person, you have to have a petition to be able to do that. The citizens can say, we no longer want this council member serving. What they do is they get a petition together and they submit that petition to the city secretary. She then has to verify the signatures on that petition. And it's a percentage of the amount of citizens that vote, registered voters in the city of Fort Worth. And right now that would be over 76,000 people, signatures, that she would have to verify. She would have to do that in 10 days according to the city charter. And so we are suggesting that we move that up to 25 days just to give her time to verify all those signatures. Because as the number of people registered, then the number um, that she has to look at increases. And this proposition number 18 is similar to the same thing. It's an initiative. That's if you wanted to propose an ordinance to the city council. You would have to do a petition with the same number of votes on it, and she would only have 10 days to verify this. So this would give her 25 days. Okay, proposition number 19, when any time the city sells property for greater than $125,000, it has to be published for four weeks in the newspaper to give notice. What we would like to do is suggest that we change that to one week and then publish it on our city's website for four weeks. So you'll still get the notice, but you'll get it in a different fashion rather than the expense of publishing it in the newspaper. All right, number 20 deals with curbs and sidewalks. Right now the charter says if the city comes in and improves a street, it is the property owners on either side of that street that must pay for the curbs and sidewalks. The city cannot pay for them. So we were suggesting we need to change that to allow the city to pay for that if the city wants to pay for that. So it's not automatically a burden of the property owners on either side. Um, proposition 21, it's a very little technical thing. The title says that the mayor will sign all contracts when in fact it's the city manager and the body of the language says it's the city manager. So the two are not consistent. So we just want to change the title there. So that's a very slight change. Um, reporting by the tax assessor in proposition number 22, it's to allow the tax assessor to provide us with the information on the assessments of real and personal property as required by state law. Right now the charter requires it on, by April 1st and that's just not consistent with what state law requires of the tax assessor. 
See, these are very exciting technical amendments, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting there. There's not too much. Um, number 23 requires public service corporations, these are utilities, to submit an annual report of the receipts of their businesses in their, to the city secretary every year. No one is doing this, and we really don't have a way to enforce it. Haven't done it for years as far as we know. And so since w this is kind of being ignored, we're suggesting we just delete this since we're not following it. All right, the contracts for official advertising in 24, right now the city averts contracts for official newspaper to do all of our publications. But we're only allowed to contract for one year at a time under the charter. We would like to be able to sign a contract for longer than that if it's advantageous to the city. In other words, we get a better price if we have a longer term, but right now we just can't do it. So annexation method and procedure in 25, this is a technical amendment for Mary because the ballot says strike out what you want to do rather than marking the ballot. It's just not consistent with how it's usually done. All right, and proposition number 26 is that we've got uh, some provisions in there when staff has gone through, they're just simply preempted by state law. Now the laws have changed, so we want to go through and just clean that up. And the last one deals with publication requirements. Would the voters agree to allow the city to publish in different methods electronically on our website rather than publish in the newspaper where it's allowed by state law? So with that, I will turn it over to Mary, and she's going to run through the process for how we get through the election. Okay. As uh, Fernando mentioned, the final report of the Charter Review Task Force after hearing, hearing all of the input from all the public hearings will be on December the 8th. And then the council will then hold public hearings at their regularly scheduled council meetings on January 12th and 26th, where folks can come forward and, and you know, continue to express you know, their opinions about what's uh, being proposed for the charter election. The council, um, we have on the calendar for the council to call the election on February 2nd, 2016, but it must be called no later than February 19th. That's a state requirement. There's a deadline at, at which time, after which you cannot call an election. Uh, or, you know, with some exceptions. This would not fall into one of the exceptions, so we have to do it then. And then the, um, if that election is called, then we would have education and community outreach, more public hearings, um, you know, on the website. We'd have, you know, various ways to reach out to the community to talk about what's actually on the ballot, what does it mean, what will be the impact of those, how will the ballot look so that when folks go to the uh, voting booth, they'll know what they're looking at. And then early voting would take place from April 25th to May 2nd. Election day would be May 7th. We would canvass the election, which Sarah mentioned. That's the official uh, receipt of the results of the election by the city council where they, they actually accept those and they're recorded in my office. And uh, because of a ch this is a charter election, we will also notify the Secretary of State that we have held a charter election and what those results are. And then the charter changes would be effective immediately unless otherwise noted. There's two on there, the um, number of council members. We noted that would not happen until after the 2020 census. And then if the compensation is changed for the council, that would become effective on October 1, 2016. That's the start of our, fis our fiscal year for 2016-2017. And that's it. That's how we would get through that process.